It's Thursday, May 2nd, 2013. I'm Rim. No, I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, camping. Let's do this. So uh, today at work, I was killing some downtime on the old tweeters, and uh, basically, Conrad and I came up with a brilliant business proposition, and I feel like you could turn this into a real, not so much a business, but at least a funny or cool app. Okay. Homeopathic iTunes. All right. So, uh, so think about this. So I made it, as, I was making a joke, because, you know. They give you money, and you give them, like, some well, bits, because but it's not an app? <laughs> a, some, a dude who was selling, basically, dowsing rods as bomb detectors was arrested and is going to jail for a long time. Hooray! So I was musing on why we don't arrest all the other people selling homeopathy. There's a lot of people selling that kind of shit. I know, and they should probably all be in jail. That's right. But I made some jokes about homeopathy, and then kind of realized something. Say we started selling homeopathic music. And the way you do it is... It's like a second of music? It's just iTunes, but it gives you just a tiny snippet of music... And just a little, maybe even just the cover art. And it assumes that if you've seen that music before, you'll remember it and play the song back in your head. All right. Thus getting a percentage of the effect of listening to the real song. Like if I see a picture of Michael Jackson and the word Billy Jean, even just the words Billy Jean, I hear a few pieces of Billy Jean repeating over and over again in my head for like the next 20 minutes. So basically, homeopathic music kind of works. Or in the very least, it works way better than actual homeopathy. <laughs> also, Billie Jean is my example because two days now I've gone to the Taco Shed by Brooklyn uh, Bridge. And both times there's been these dudes who hang out and do mediocre breakdancing. And they always do the same set. Every day at noon, they do Gangnam Style and then Billie Jean. I was on the train just now. Yeah. And the dancing guys were in the next subway car over. Yep. I peeped them through the window. Gangnam style? No. Billie Jean? I couldn't hear their music at all because I was. they were in the next subway car. It was a loud subway and I had my headphones in. No. Nah. They looked real derpy just sort of dancing with no music, doing their grab onto the subway bar, flipping around stuff. It looked very uncoordinated with no rhythm whatsoever. Well, living in New York, much <laughs> like how you learn pretty, pretty quickly that the majority of people with instruments... Anywhere in public, don't actually know how to play shit, and they just kind of doodle enough to where if you walk by and you're not really paying attention, it sounds like they're playing music. I think the majority of break dancers on the streets of New York City are the same way. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it's Thursday. It's the lounge. It's your mom. Care to talk about anything on the lounge? <laughs> no. The Geek Nights Lounge. I'm boycotting the lounge. It's the lounge. We just kind of hang out and talk. Just stop calling it the lounge. Uh, and then, well, uh, what are you, you going to talk about then? I you got, got nothing. news? No, I got nothing, actually. You really have nothing? <laughs> There's nothing. I have a cough. Well, it's, I, I was coughing in the morning. All right, so what? I woke up and I was like, BK. <laughs> Shit. I wonder uh, how many Monday listeners know why we say BK instead of bike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we, I remember we got an email from a dude in like 2006 who was like, guys, it's pronounced Chipotle, not Chipotle. And we had to be like, yeah, we yeah, know. Yeah, it's also a clash of the Titans. So you admit that it's actually Titans and that you just do that because it's funny. What did I just say? All right, Scott. So uh, what's the name of the song? I believe it's Have You Never Been Mellow. What song are you talking about? The song in DDR, Have You Never Been Mellow? I've never heard of that song. So you're, you d- <laughs> <laughs> I see what's going on here. So I got something I want to talk about. I actually about. just listened to that song today. I uh, just danced that song a few days ago. DDR is my thing. I'm, I got a, I'm in a DDR mood. So not denying. For those of you who weren't alive and conscious enough in the 90s, in the 80s, to remember this, let alone people who are old enough to remember actual anarchists, <laughs> uh, May Day is a day every year where it's basically morons May, May in Western countries will, be. and particularly in places like Seattle, <laughs> Toronto, California, all of it, will basically protest nothing. Yep. The man. It's, it's people They're protesting the man. Who are ostensibly anarchists of some stripe, or maybe they're anti corporatists or whatever. They're all the same kinds of people with the same weirdo talking points. Like, take the people who did Occupy Wall Street and go one step crazier. Exactly one step. It doesn't really get crazier than Contrail Guy. 
Yeah, well, chemtrail guy is way beyond all of that. It's like a separate spectrum. But there's there's a particular class of people who will do the Occupy thing in that kind of derpy way that they do their thing. One step beyond that is the self-described anarchist. Basically, it's the equivalent of hipsters who pretend to be into politics and live on the West Coast. And They're really about equivalent to Ron Paul guy in my book. Yeah, like they, I've never understood what they actually want, what they're actually after. Don't think they know about anarchy. At best, they're like the anarchists in uh, Chesterton's book, The Man Who Was Thursday. Right. They're basically anti, you know, current society, and they just want to, you know, fight against it. So the first thing that comes along that is a replacement, they latch onto it, and that's their thing. But what's even funnier is that one step beyond them are the guys who are Mm -hmm. anarchists in quotes, but they pretend to be old-timey anarchists, and they actually wear bandanas and are ready to fight the cops and basically provoke fights with riot police without fail every year on May 1st. And every time there's a G7 or any or a WTO conference, they show up, they break a bunch of windows of like Starbucks's, they try to flip over cars. As soon as the police come anywhere near them, they start screaming, the man, the man, they're getting me. I'm going to sue you for arresting me, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And in the 90s, this was always in the news. It's basically not in the news anymore. My news... It's just to show people who don't pay attention that this still happens. Yeah. And it's kind of hilarious because at least in the 80s and in the early to mid 90s, because there wasn't an Internet like we know today, this stuff would make the mainstream news. And you could kind of understand at least like these are people who have a thing and this is the only way they can get attention. But there's really no excuse for this bullshit anymore. And no one sides with them. At all anymore. Well, they side with themselves. There's yeah. more than one of them. And that's pretty it's much it. It's not just one guy. There's still these two guys, and they side with each other, so that's who sides with them. To quote one of them, they're just doing them. what they need to do to stand up for ourselves. These are our streets, and we have the right to take them. Says the guy who basically breaks some Starbucks windows and then screams I don't think you have a right arrested. to break the Starbucks windows. Yeah. The Starbucks window is not part of the streets. <laughs> so... If you're not aware of this subculture, take a gander at this article because the headlining picture says everything. Two totally normal police, but because it's Seattle, they look like bike cops. They're bicycle police. In shorts. And they're just dragging away this guy who looks like he deserves to be dragged away and or tased and has the exact face that people like this tend to have when they're being arrested for doing their absolutely nothing wrong that they were doing. So that's all I got to say. If you're not aware of these morons, this is all kind of funny. And this is coming from someone who thinks we should be doing protests for things like this, but actually about real things. What are they protesting even? They're just protesting the man. They're yep. not, they don't have a specific thing. Protesters began throwing metal rods and water bottles at officers and business windows. Damn. And then the officers walked in and just started arresting If you're going to protest, you got to be Gandhi style. If you're throwing shit, it's like, well... Fuck you. You can throw shit in certain situations. Confetti. But you're now. I can even. <laughs> I can even rationalize certain kinds of violent protests. However, that's neither here nor there because nothing related to the May first WTO anti globalization protest for the last twenty plus years has been even close to reasonable. No. All right. But anyway, things of the day. Uh, I used to be a big fan of these sort of things, and I can't, you know, especially in the early anime con days, like the fake trailer to a movie, like the fake trailer to Evangelion, or take a movie trailer and mash it up with an anime or something like that. Uh, this is a gritty movie trailer, and these people seem to have done several, but this one's probably the best one. Basically, they make fake movie trailers that are the gritty reboot of X, because that seems to be what Hollywood does lately. Did you do a gritty reboot of something that's already gritty? Uh, that'd be pretty good. Well, you know what? I would do a gritty reboot of Batman. It's just Batman going, I'm not the hero that Gotham wants. And then it's just him, Hannibal Lecter. Anyway, this is a gritty reboot of Calvin and Hobbes. And the reason I make this my thing of the day is that it's not only well done and apt in many ways, but if this were a real movie, I would actually consider watching it once it came to Netflix. (laughs) Calvin and Hobbes uh, mixes seem to be very popular lately. The past, I mean, they've been popular always, but lately I think the frequency in which new ones appear has been increasing steadily. I think it's partly because the people who grew up reading Calvin and Hobbes all have money and professional lives now. Maybe. And media production got easier. 
and you can't make anything legit related to Calvin and Hobbes, but you can totally make parodies. All right. So check this out, right? Uh, normally, if you're the kind of person who makes, like, you know, models or, you know, miniatures or anything like that, you know, it, it requires a lot of careful skills to, you know, do good stuff, right? So it's like if you got a Gundam or something, you got to, like, airbrush each piece, you know, and carefully mask off different parts and draw the panel lines. With, or if you do, like, a Warhammer, it's like, you know, you got to get a really pointy brush and, like, paint in some eyeballs on your orc or whatever, right? And it's, yep. it's all about this careful, high skill, lots of practice kind of work. So this guy here has the greatest method of putting damage, right? Damage is a thing that you want to do pretty often, right? You want to make a guy look like he got hurt, yep. right? Oh, especially if it's something involved in a battle, right? Or maybe you even want to do a car model and make it look like it crashed. So he has a Gundam, and he wants to make it look like it's been in a battle. He does this in the least skilled way I've ever seen. I could even do it. <laughs> and it comes out better looking than almost... Anything I've seen, all you have to do after you do his method is basically spray like a top coat on it to seal in the damage so that it doesn't uh, rub off. But he has like this amazing method of making the kit look damaged that is trivially simple. Any If you've never built a Gundam model before, you can do this. And it looks like a pro did it, you know, all carefully by hand. So really, anyone who's doing this sort of damage look by hand, you're fucking stupid. You can just do it this way, and it comes out looking better and more natural. Not too shabby. All right. In the meta moment, the Geek Nights Book Club book is Player of Games I by finished it today. Ian M. Banks. I will start reading it today. You know what? There's a guy in the book. Let me guess. Plays let me get, wait, let a me lot guess. of motherfucking games. Scott, spoilers. Jesus, fuck. <laughs> and you know what? Even though he plays many different games, mostly... <laughs> There's just one game he plays a whole lot. But that game has a lot of sub-games. Uh, you know, it'd be funny if that game was just Counter-Strike. And- no, it's a fictional made-up <laughs> yeah, game. Course. It might as well be Benju- Benjuka. It's, Benjuka. it's basically Benjuka. Only they describe it a little bit more, but not totally. All right. So uh, we uploaded uh, numerous recent lectures from Penny Arcade Expos and the likes. You should check out our YouTube channels. I'll link to them in the thing. We're going to be at... Coming up very soon, Anime Boston doing not one, not two, not three, not four, but five lectures. Whoa. And Emily will also be doing a lecture. Whoa. We're doing a ton of crap there. Anime Boston is going to be awesome. And the time we're not doing them, we'll either be in the tabletop area or out on Newbury Street eating expensive food. Mm, or coughing and sneezing or barfing if it's Anime Boston. Not too long after that, we will be at Kineticon helping run and running the panels and workshops department and doing panels and lectures. Woo. And then immediately after that, Scott and I are fly- flying to the land out under to present Beyond Dungeons and Dragons 2.0 version beta, all new content at PAX Australia. Okay. I'm pretty excited about this. And then, of course, we're going to be at PAX Dev and PAX Prime and then MAGFest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we did not submit any panels to Oticon after three years of being blacklisted officially. Uh, we're not going to bother even trying to submit any words. Clearly, they don't want us there. So if you want us at Oticon, tell them because it's obvious or that us submitting panels. Take over Oticon. Yeah, guys. Join the staff. Take over. That's how we took over Kineticon. <laughs> it's working out pretty well. <laughs> not going too badly. Uh, any other meta things? No more meta? I don't know. The backgammon round of the Grand Prix is almost over. Another round will begin soon. Not too many people participated in the backgammon round, even though it went pretty well, relatively speaking. The next round is going to be much easier and more straightforward. You know, I would have participated in the whole Grand Prix. The only reason I didn't is that you're, you had a wall of text that I didn't fully read, so I missed the registration that's, Well, date. that's important. That's part of the thing, is if you want to get to read the fucking rules. Yep, and I wasn't willing to do that, so I'm completely out. I'm not going to participate. <laughs> just at all? No. You missed one round, you're just going to quit? I pretty much said that as soon as I was like, hey, is it too late? You were like, yep, and I'm like, well, I'm out of the Grand Prix. <laughs> I have the chat log to show it, to prove it. Was? You think you can't come back? I just don't really care. It's not, I wouldn't have even had time or effort to do the backgammon round probably. Well, apparently you didn't even have time or effort to read something, which takes about a minute to read, so you didn't care that much to begin with. No, well, by the time I read it, it was already too late. <laughs> Why didn't you read it as soon as it, I put it there? Partly because I was busy. You know, it doesn't take long to read things. Sometimes it, it does. It seems like I'm the only person in the world who, like, reads things as soon as they're posted and reads them really, really quickly and reads all the words of I everything. I only actually read our forum once or twice a day at most. I don't read every thread. 
I don't read every thread, but if there's something I want to read, I'm constantly checking it and I read it completely and really, really quickly. Like whoosh. And I read like tons and tons of things really fast all the time. I don't know okay. why. And it's weird that no one else does this because basically it's like, why? I know all these things. No one knows these things. Well, I mean, I think it's good for you because I know about things that matter and I don't know about things that don't mm -hmm. matter. This is why I don't use things like Google Reader because that's more data than I need. Well, I don't use Google Reader either. But Most like, of it's useless. I'll read Boing Boing and I'll just whoosh. And I can just scroll down the page in like 30 seconds and basically get all the headlines. Yeah, and Scott, then I do the same thing. But you know what I do with that with? Google News. Google I do with Finance. Google News also. Yeah. I can basically far. read like many, many websites, just like tab, whoosh, tab, whoosh, tab, whoosh, tab, whoosh in like a minute. And then if there's articles I wanted, I already clicked on them to open them a new yeah. tab. And it takes me about a minute per article to read all the words. Good for you. And what I'm saying it. is, yes, that's a common skill. I simply don't consume the same things you consume. But then it's like, but that is you, uh, you know, you missed a thing. I missed a thing. I think you're missing my unstated point. Wasn't super into the thing to begin with, so I didn't read it right away. I only read things uh, I'm super into right away. I'm super into everything all the time. Are you? You're into everything all the time. What don't I know? Why didn't you bike today? Because I'm coughing. All right, so you're not super into biking right now. <laughs> if you cared about it, you would have I biked. tried to bike, and then I went outside, and I was like, <laughs> I went back inside. Uh-huh. Anyway, so camping, we have... Uh, I had a bunch of. I want to talk about transhumanism. I got these great show ideas. Scott doesn't want to talk about. What any do you of that say shit. about transhumanism? You got nothing to say. Uh, I got about an hour's worth of discussion. I do Plus, not. remember, I don't have anything to say. You seem to forget that, especially on Thursday episodes, listeners don't really care about our specific direct. Listeners opinions aren't even listening to this stupid or show. Or are open, you know, like oh, Nobody let's expound for an hour. Nobody listens to this podcast. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Your self-deprecating act is kind of old. You just say the same things over and over again. That's true. As opposed to your self-aggrandizing act. What did I say right now? I did, we have at least one listener, so I think I could at least extrapolate the, the from listener. that that there are two. So, I can, so it is okay for me to estimate that I can say listeners. If you say that because there's one listener, there must be two listeners, then then you then might as well be you might can extrapolate this infinity listeners. Not nah, because one the difference between one and two. I mean, look, one, two, three, many. So I think there's one of those four. I think there's one listener. <laughs> anyway. So, as a result, the thing is, you see what I'm doing there, right? Yeah. Right? Right? right. The right? thing is, right? 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 Suffice to right? say. Right? <laughs> Suffice to say, the thing is, right, you know. <laughs> but now, I think the, the person who does listen to this show is more interested in the banter than in the expounding opinion, especially well, That's on why Thursday we just spent topics. like a good minute not even completely dodging our topic but and I'm killing saying, time you saying, to right, you know. But I'm saying, you seem to if we pick a topic that's just some bullshit... We'll just bullshit for an hour. We're we'll just talk. bullshitting right now. We're we'll not talk saying anything. The way we talk. Everyone who's the one listener already stopped listening at this point. Are you kidding? This is their favorite shit. No, it's not. Uh, listeners, tell this us. This is because the worst shit. Every time I have ever turned to the listener and asked him or her <laughs> what They've he been likes. silent. I'm, I, we always get like one email that's like, actually, I really like the episode you did about blah. I don't know why Scott was so down on it. <laughs> You That's should. what the listener sounds like. I don't that know. That listener everybody. is pretty sad. You should be listening to some better podcast or doing something else with your time besides uh, listening. To, if you're listening to this right now, that is sad. Anyway, guy, would you like us to talk about transhumanism? What do we have to say about or it? Or the surveillance society or we urination? Said every, we've already discussed because that. Because we already did a show on pooping, so urination was also There's a topic. There's a lot less to say about urination than I poop. got a lot to say about urination, but Scott wants nothing to do with these topics. <laughs> I got nothing to say. So I've realized that a lot of people I know in the real world have never, ever in their lives been camping in any capacity. A lot of these people might be urban peoples. But not all of them not by any them. stretch. A lot of them are suburban peoples who just don't leave society and go to the woods or anything. Well, I've realized something, because I was kind of thinking about this in light of, for example, the fact that I would say the majority of people I know, until recently if not currently still don't, don't actually know how to use gears on bikes. Like, it's I, just a common You know thing. what? Yesterday, when I was biking up the, the bridge, there was some girl, and she was going, eh, eh, in the highest possible gear. And I was actually like, hey, you should use some gears. And she actually wasn't like, yeah, don't tell me what to do, whatever. She was actually like, oh, okay. Did she? Yeah. Downshift? She did. Ah. She, she asked her out. 
No, she wasn't. I could tell that she was sort of like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, let me see some So just like Rainbow Dash. Uh, no. Different like, kind of oh my gosh. Like, let me see space princess. But I'm a glad. I realized that the reason I knew how to shift gears, and I can't say it's not, not to fault people who don't, because it seems like it's the vast majority of people. I mean, I just found this article talking about how with all these new bike paths in New York City and the city bike program, there's classes for adults who never learned how to ride a bike to learn how to ride a bike without being embarrassed. Mm. Like they're semi-private classes and they're stupidly popular. And there's a whole industry now in teaching adults how to ride bikes. Yep. Then they're teaching like, don't fall over. Don't fall over. Let's take the training wheels off now. They're not teaching like advanced shifting techniques. Yep. Not everyone grew up riding a bike. But even the people who grew up riding a bike often don't know how to shift. And I think the only reason I knew how to shift was that I grew up in a family that had a culture of bicycle riding together in groups and going to the woods and like biking through the nope. woods. You know how I knew how to shift? Uh-huh. They bought, I had it when I was a kid. I had a tricycle. And then I had a two-wheel bike with training wheels. BMX bike? No, nah, no, it was just sort of a two, you know, a little bike. Regular bike, no gear shifting, coaster brake. Yep, but it was, you know, two wheels, whatever. Most kids get what is effectively a BMX bike, even if they don't use it for the things that BMX bikes are often yeah, used for. it wasn't BMX bike, but then, you know, I was biking it, and then, you know, I got too big for that shit, so I got a 10-speed bike, and I was like, oh, what do these buttons do? And switches and things, and I looked at the gears... And then I've moved them all around and figured out how they worked yep. on my own. I'm just like, this thing's here. Clearly, there is a reason for these things to be here. I will push them all around to figure it out. And then I was like, oh, if I use these ones, it's harder to pedal. But I go faster if I can pedal. And if I go this way, it's easy to pedal. So I can go up a hill real easy. And it was just my natural curiosity and exploration of doing things. And I noticed there's a different kind of mentality that some people have where they just don't want to touch things. They th say, say, leave it there. Like, I think there's one other factor with biking in particular. and I'm, I'll get I think it's an anti-intellectual attitude no, that I do not like. Bi with biking specifically, it's the fact that on, most people don't bike in ways that even really need the gears unless you live like in the city. So I think there's If two there is a hill... Exactly. You know At where all. I grew up, Unless Scott? you live you somewhere that's 100% flat. You know where I grew up? Or on a beach. There aren't hills in Michigan. At all. Not even it one is, hill? It, it is literally, if you bike in southeast Michigan, completely flat. 100% flat. Yes, effectively 100% flat. Okay. So the only even people... Because right next to my house. You know what's right next to my house? That road. You yep, know that road. Yep. It's a hill. So... Nothing but hills. As a kid, I learned how to use gears, and everyone in my family knew how to use gears, but most people I knew didn't, and the difference was we went biking out in the woods on trails where there were hills. Up, there were basically hills because you're out in the woods. There's hills there. There are hills. Even if I had been somewhere totally flat, I still would have messed around with the gears and figured out what they did. Oh no, a lot of people messed around with the gears, but they they never fully grokked how to use them, or even if they grok how to use them in a or not grok, but they get how to use them in a basic sense. What they don't get is the kind of subtle things that require a little bit of mastery, like exactly how to let up on pressure to shift and then start going again on an uphill. Well, that's if you have a certain kind of uh, it's the, if you have a certain kind of gears, you don't need to let off the pressure to shift. You don't have those gears. Yeah, actually, I do. No, you don't. You cannot maintain full pressure going up a hill and downshifts. It depends. If you do that, you're gonna you're basically gonna cause a little wear on your gears in the long run, and or fuck your chain up. There's one kind of gear that's a, the teeth are different shapes, so you can shift while uh, while you're pedaling. Yeah, I can shift while I'm pedaling. Versus stop pedaling, but and you then still shift. let up on the pressure if you're full force pressure. Well, it's all about the t the tensioning thing at the bottom, right? If it hit, yeah, no, no, no. Even then, if, if that you hits, let up if on that the pressure, the limit, then you're in trouble. But if not even then, you let up on the pressure slightly whenever you shift. Nah, I've never had any problem. You're probably not pushing too hard. Nah. Anyway, but it's because I of also the culture. Usually what I'm getting downshift at before I get to a hill, not uh, on the hill. Yes, but if you're going to shift on the hill, you like, shouldn't. Uh, you often will. For example, I'm in a certain gear going up the Williamsburg Bridge. Jackasses on fixies are blocking the entire way, and I have to slow down. Mm. Now I need to downshift on the hill. Mm. Any, and that happens every morning. Don't have that problem. Yeah, bike over the Williamsburg Bridge in the morning. There's like a hundred assholes walking fixies up the bridge in both directions. Come on, cops. Do something about it. It's not illegal. 
It should be illegal to have a fixie on the streets. It should be illegal to have a fixie on the streets. It should not be illegal to have a single gear bike. That's just dumb. Yeah. If you see a single gear bike, you smile and nod like, oh. Yeah. But if you see a fixie, uh, it's like seeing a drunk driver. Exactly. Anyway, not the bike show. My point is, <laughs> with camping, everyone I know who knows how to camp and has camped grew up in a family culture of family camping trips. Everyone Our I know family. who has never camped and does not know how to camp did never never went on a family camping trip because their family was not into camping. Our family did not have a culture of camping, but we had a culture of send kids to summer camp. Which so I, have which you I, ever I'm, been Like camping? when I was a kid, I sort of assumed everyone went to summer camp, and only later in life did I realize, oh... Only some people send their kids to summer yeah, camp, like, and most people fucking don't because they're stupid as shit. No, the thing is, there's a different... Or can't afford it. There's a different world. In the Midwest, the, the stuff of summer camp is just in the neighborhood. There are neighborhood summer camps you can go to. But you don't need to go away to camp. You just There's just shooting ranges you just go to as kids in the summer and just shoot. And there's just archery ranges you just go to and just fuck around in the woods and whatever. Uh, so you didn't need to go to camp to get those experiences. Uh, summer camp is his own thing. You yeah, I know. You, Scott, you're saying that. What I'm going to say is that the most people I know for whom summer camp was a thing, like a thing as opposed to just, yeah, I went to summer camp once or twice, are kids who grew up in Connecticut and New York and New Jersey and I almost think, nowhere else. I think else. it's a Northeast thing. I don't know. It is. <laughs> go to the Midwest. It's not a big thing. Kids generally don't go to summer camp. They will summer go to, camp like, is the best. They'll go to like... Week long camps like Space Camp or Science Camp or uh, uh, Starbase mm. or Programmer Camp, but they won't go to I am away from home for more than a couple of weeks. Camp. Eight, eight week sleepaway camp is should every kid should have that. In fact, it should be sort of like public school. We should have public sleepaway camp for eight weeks every summer. I don't know. I think you're too to close it. to it because you grew up in a culture of that. that summer was, camp is the that best. That culture did not exist where I grew up, and I frankly don't think I missed much. It's the best. You missed a lot more than you realized. Like what? It's, it's pretty much the greatest. Like, okay. That's, you know, there's not, there's not, it's sort of like you watch freaking, um, salute your shorts. That looks like a horrible existence. That is That I the... would have avoided at all costs. My summers <laughs> were fuck around in the woods with my own friends, uh, fuck around on my computer in my house, play video games. Hey, you know, uh, my summer at the summer camp was... You know, capture the flag with uh, oh, yeah, across the, the entire summer camp with all all hundred plus kids. We do that with like the like dozens of kids in the woods on our own. We'd play softball every Sunday just with a whole bunch of people, two full teams. Yeah, but that's see, this is the thing, right? You played softball every Sunday, two full teams. This is you're there for eight weeks. This goes on for twenty four hours a day, every day for eight weeks, nonstop awesomeness. Right? Yeah. It's like you play Capture the Flag in the woods with 200 kids. And then immediately after, you're playing D&D. And then immediately after, it's like nonstop. Yeah. So I would play it. Yeah. My summers are mostly like that. There's only sleeping stops. And that's pretty much it. Plus, it was that and I had access to my computer. Go but boating anyway, in the lake. I think we didn't we do a show on summer camp. I'm talking more about yeah. camping, actual camping. Well, that's, that's part of summer camp also is. When you're at summer camp, you know, you stay in the cabin most of the time, but you're guaranteed to have at least one camping where you grab all the tents and you go out into the woods. How far? Are the, I'm, so I'm curious. Cause there's degrees of camping. It, depend, it depends on the summer camp. So you personally. <laughs> so the one degree is you go, you basically take a camper or something or stay in a lodge or log cabin somewhere. Well, that's summer camp default, right? Yeah, so, so. I've, we've, I've done that. You've yeah, done that. Yeah, that doesn't even really count. That's like you're in a house just in the woods. There's... You go a trivial distance from a place like that and set up tents. I did camping. that when I was a counselor, you know, and the, I had little kids. So basically that was the camping that we did with All them. All right. <laughs> There's you hike a significant distance into the woods, camp, and then possibly continue on from that and set up a second camp. I've done that as well. When All I right. was in the camp, when I was in the summer camp, we hiked and we passed the Hicks house, and the Hicks had a natural spring, and we drank their water, yep. and it was like an adventure, and we went over the, out of the valley the camp was in to the next valley, and then we went to the second valley, and then we came two valleys back. Yeah. There's doing that in the winter. I didn't do it in the winter, but I did it in the desert. All right, so what was the desert camp like? The desert of Israel? Yeah. You walk all day next to a camel. You drink a lot of water. You keep walking, lots of walking, looking at desert shit, and then eventually you get when the sun goes down. You sort of sleep in the desert, and but the thing is, you sleep 
it's like a company did it, I guess. So basically they had these pre-prepared sleeping places and it wasn't like it was some sort of shelter that you were sleeping in, right? It was pretty much the middle of the desert. They had a spot that they had lights installed so that no scorpions would bite you at night. Yeah. And I mean, actually, was, you even know. like hiking on the Adirondack Trail or whatever, it's kind of the same thing, but they'll be like, you'll hike and hike and hike. And occasionally there'll be these shelters, but I say it in quotes because they're basically <laughs> just... A slightly raised platform of semi-rotten logs. Yeah, I was basically and a roof. I was sleeping in a sleeping bag on the sand, and that was it. Except for lights that would keep bugs away. I'm really, I'm actually and a nasties. big fan. Like, I like doing <laughs> sort of death march hikings that are, don't necessarily involve camping. Like, let's go to a trailhead, hike for like 30 miles, and then end up back at a place where a car will take us back to the hotel. But I also like the the thing where you like hike, you get to a trailhead with all your shit. <laughs> You hike like a whole day out somewhere. You set up a base camp and then every day you do hikes out from the base camp to other places. Maybe you like bring a pup tent and you sleep like out one night at a secondary camp away from the base camp. And then the next day or two, you return back to the base camp. See, the thing is, I'm not really too much into the walking around in the woods. I like the making a campfire. Campfire is other than uh, campfire chili. And campfire uh, curry. <laughs> yeah. Campfire is the best part of camping. Camp- camping. I love campfire, you know, doing campfire activities, eating campfire food, cooking campfire food, right? That's the number I really one like best part. The simple stuff like hobo meal. Hot dog on a, on a stick you took from the woods. Just grab a hot, cold hot dog. Wait, took from the woods? Like you found the hot dog? No, tree you got the you stick from the woods. Of it. You grab a stick from the woods, you take an, a defrosted frozen hot dog, you shove it on the end after you sanitize the stick in the fire. You stick the hot dog in the fire, and then you eat it off the stick, and then you put a marshmallow on the stick the hot right, dog so was on. so you've clearly... Have you ever gone camping where you had to bring primarily non-perishable goods that don't require any refrigeration of any kind? Uh, well, I mean, it was all... Like, you can't... Like, for the kind of camping I used to do, you can't The longest bring... camp was in the desert for, like, you know, I guess three, four days. But so I'm saying, all like, the food, you can't... The camel carried all the food. Yeah, but I'm saying you can't bring things that require cooling or refrigeration... Most of the time. Oh, yeah. The, well, the hot dog situation was mostly like, well, we, that was mostly uh, in summer camp, right? Basically, once a week, we would just, they had basically these campfires, like, in the woods on the edge of the camp. So once a week, you would just do campfire without camping. So it's like, you'd go do a campfire and then go to bed in the cabin. Cabin. I think, but it's just the campfire <laughs> so is you were the able best. To, you were able to get campfires without camping. You only well, camp, like, once look every at, four weeks. Look at how much we like, like, at one of Skojo's parties or, like, at our friend's wedding before. Yep. There's something about you start a big fire and you and all your good it's friends. the first invention. Not before even, they not, had TV, before they had books. No, it's not the same fire. if it's, like, acquaintances Fire's the or one strangers. Thing. <laughs> but if it's, like, your close friends... And a relatively small group of you, you got a fire in the middle, you sit around the fire, mostly not talking, staring at the fire, drinking things, maybe cooking marshmallows, yep. your feet get too hot and your, sh- your shoes melt a little bit you, sit, you fuck you up. don't sit down, win. There's always Unless that you're one, a camion. There's always that one group of people <laughs> who sits there and they talk about, oh, we should do something to the fire. Hey, I think I'm going to put another log on the fire. Man, you made a really good fire. Yeah, The fire managers. Fire. But then there's the other people who ignore that and sit there saying nothing. Yep. And then there's the people who play Ben Junka. <laughs> <laughs> there's something about that. But no, that's what I'm saying is like we think about all the different mediums of entertainment, you know, TV, movies, books, music, Fire video really games, important. board games. Fire, it was the first one. Like sitting And it's in, the one that's least enjoyed by I people. I think the reason but here's why I like camping so much. We combine all these things that as adults we don't and as adults who are no longer in college we don't get them often anymore. These are things you really only get in college or you get snippets of them camping as a kid at summer camps, places like that. You get one, sit around the fire, which we just talked about why that's great. Mm-hmm. Two, you get the sleepover situation of you and a bunch of friends are in a tent or sleeping isolated and nobody will shut the fuck up, mm-hmm. which is a very important aspect of enjoyment. Three, you don't have access to your technology, and you're basically just hanging out with each other. And four, there is no way you can do any work or be productive in any way. So as a result, you're going to do nothing but fuck around. Mm-hmm. 
Those are the four key elements that make camping great. And the there is another camp, element that you're forgetting. Nah. See, I don't really like walking long distance in the I woods, do. right? But explore the woods, right? Because a lot of times a woods will have all sorts of, you know, hidey holes and type of things, the kind of things that inspired, like, you know, Zelda 1 and Miyazaki movies, yep. right? So it's like near your camp, there's going to be like, ooh, that weird tree that looks like maybe someone was lynched on it. Ooh, and there's that weird kind of cave. Ooh, and there's that little rock thing that hides some salamanders under it. And all that kind of action that's right near, you know, and you can explore all those bits. Down by the stream. Oh, look, there's a little there's a little nook in the stream. There's something going on over here. And you check out all that stuff. That's really good. That's the other aspect you did not mention. They're good aspects. I like that aspect a lot. Now, there are problems with camping. One, most people I've known who have camped in quotes... I've never actually camped, and they usually bring these gigantic tents yeah, well, and these gigantic pavilions. The more and money you spend on your camp equipment, the less you are actually camping, and the no, more no, no. you are. It's like a portable you'll spend, hotel. You'll spend more on better equipment. The problem is just bringing bulky and or useless equipment or equipment that makes it more like the well, more no, you make people, it like a hotel. People like drive their SUV, back it up into the camp and use the power of the SUV to turn a TV on and shit, right? It's like, come on. That's not camping. That's just portable motel. Right, exactly. So like, I think a lot of those super giant tents, that's basically portable hotel, right? It's like you have to be abandoning a certain amount of stuff and only do the camp stuff for it to be camping. Yep. You know, this, and it's obviously, it's like, okay, obviously, you don't have to just go naked into the woods and hunt and gather all your food, right? And, and make fire with only sticks and not bring any matches. There's, there's, a, there's a line, right? And it's, you know, it's a little gray area of how much stuff can you bring. It's like, can you bring, you know, a little gas lighter? It's like, yeah, you can bring that. All right. Can you bring some log that automatically sets on fire? That's nah, sort of cheating. You should probably collect some firewood. That's well, not it's, that it's, hard. I guess it's, there's it's the difference between people who know basic survival skills and bring the right things mm. versus people who bring things that seem comfortable but don't really understand the ramifications of those things. Yeah, it's like, can you bring a tent yet to protect yourself from the elements? It's like, yeah, you probably need one of those motherfuckers. Well, it depends. You economize like, what kind can of Can I tent? bring basically a pavilion? It's like. You could, but that's basically you're not in the woods well, anymore. Well, it depends. For example, you bring the pavilion to your base camp, and then you set out with a lesser amount of material uh, out from the base camp. I had to see the pavilion to judge it. It might be too fancy, a pavilion. I guess if it has some sort of climate control that's not just flaps, then it's too much. But the thi th there are, you know, the things that If it I has lights, too much. The things I do dislike about camping that... Uh, Mosquitoes. Depends on where you are. Yes, you got to choose a good general. spot to avoid that shit. But also things like uh, not really being able to bathe. Well, you don't go for that long. Yeah, you do. You I've, go, I've been camping for weeks. You also <laughs> haven't been camping for weeks. All, and, and then you always find, you know, like a stream or something to roll around in. That's often not. You got to camp near some water. I don't. Well, this, all right. In particular, if you've ever been winter camping. You basically cannot bathe. That's true. Well, desert, we couldn't bathe. But we were only in the desert for, I think, four days. Something like that. So we bathed before we left, and we bathed and got back. No. Covered in sand otherwise. But it's dry sand, so no one was really sticky. It's a dry heat. Yeah. It's a desert. <laughs> it's, <laughs> come on. But that's pretty much it. That and people, sometimes if you run out of food or you camp for too long, the food basically gets increasingly worse the longer you have camped. Mm. Because you're eating... The more preserved food, you've got less <laughs> fresh eggs and bacon and more jerky and well, trail mix. Unless you actually hunt and gather. Which yeah, which I've never, I've gathered, but I've never hunted. Uh, yeah, I didn't hunt. And I, I haven't gathered. gathered much. I've done so far as gathering things like, uh, I have gathered nuts in some places. I've never seen a nut tree. <laughs> and I have gathered like cattails because you can take the roots and they're super good. They're like scallions. Mm. And I've gathered dandelion. And I don't like to eat dandelion. Dandelion's delicious. That's a weed. That's it's not a delicious food. shit. It's a weed. It's not a food. Uh, yeah, a lot of things that you consider food are also considered weeds. No. And dandelions are food. No. In fact, that LIC place we get brunch at has a really good dandelion frittata. Is it run by hippies? Actually, no. Uh-huh. It's got a lot of fancy restaurants sell and serve dandelions. Fresh Direct sells dandelions. A lot of fancy restaurants these days are hippie restaurants. Uh, Non-hippie restaurants, Scott. Uh-huh. How come they're not coming to harvest uh, my lawn? Because your lawn has pesticides and bullshit on it, and that's not efficient in any way. Hey. 
Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but there's always amateur hour too. I've, I've many times I've been camping with people who don't quite know what's up. Number one, the person who does not understand how tents work. No, <laughs> I can't set up the tent. These are the that's that's, a, that's so common. It's made fun of in like every TV show or movie about camping. Dude can't set up the tent. It's he, like the first joke. But it's the specific thing that I always see happen are the people who, because they haven't really been outdoorsy people, they seem to make this differentiation in their mind between indoors and outdoors. Mm. Like they don't think about the fact that we're sitting, you know, indoors doing geek nights and 10 feet to my left is outdoors. Yep. It's right there all the time. There's not any real well, difference between no, but the two. That's true, but doors have a psychological effect on people. Like a lot, you know, I noticed I've read about this a lot in terms of like video game level design. It's like they'll put a door when they want you to sort of psychologically change your frame of, of reference. So like if you put a door like in between two rooms and the two rooms, the puzzle spans the two rooms, you're gonna fuck ev- everyone up because when they go into room two Room one gets washed away from their brains by yep. the door. So you got that's why in Zelda, it's always you're not going to see a door splitting up a puzzle into separate pieces too often, right? It's always you know each room has a puzzle to it, and it's the same thing with the real world. When you go in a door, right? I come into your apartment, I forget the hallway, but the hallway's right there. It's so close, but it's not in my mind. It's compartmentalized by the physical doors, and so is the you know the wilderness when you leave your car. Suddenly you're outside and it's totally like different from being in the car, even though physically you're like an inch away. There's just glass in between, right? It's like if you park your car on the side of the highway and get out to pee, it's like, whoa, totally different world suddenly. Yep. I used to do that very often when I drive back from uh, Rochester to Michigan just for like weekends to see my family or whatever. I'd always do it in the middle of the night. Like I'd leave at like midnight. And drive through the night. And these were these very pleasant, like, I have these many fond memories of just blasting music and driving through the night on an empty highway with blackness in all directions. And occasionally, I'd just stop on the side of the freeway, just turn off my engine, and get out of the car, and just walk, like, off into a field for a few minutes. It was just a very interesting and kind of eerie experience. Mm. Why don't we talk about... But <laughs> what I'm getting at is that these people think of the inside of their tent as indoors, and they do not understand how capillary action works and they don't understand that tents are often not actually waterproof, <laughs> and their bedroll is right up next to the fucking edge of their tent, and or they didn't put a tarp over the top of their tent, and it rains or it dews, the entire inside of their tent is soaking wet the next day. Yeah, it's bad. Is that, I'm guessing this has happened to you. Uh, never happened to me, because I, I know it better. happened to someone you were with. I was a Cub Scout. I learned, I had actual lessons on this bullshit. Mm-hmm. I've seen it happen to so many people. Amateur hour number two, are the people who don't stake their tent down and it just blows away. or <laughs> That's the most common joke you see. Or they put their tent in what appears like a good spot that is actually a place where rainwater will collect and or wash. Mm. Mm. All right. Yeah. Why don't we talk about going to the bathroom when camping? Just fucking pee in the woods. It's awesome. Yeah, but what if you uh, got to poop? Depends. So sometimes I've been to places where we're camping, like our base camp, is near a place where the park service or someone has dug latrines or set up pl- uh, designated places that it'll be taken care of for. porta potties. I have only once or twice in my life gone camping in such a place where I either had to poop in a bag and take it out with me, which in some preserves you have to do that, mm. or you have to dig a cat hole. And let me tell you, if you are going somewhere where you're going to have to dig cat holes, for the love of God, learn how to do that so no Don't fuck it up, poop. or bears will come and murder you. That's also true. That's why you need the anti-bear weapon thing. You need the bear ball. You need the bear blasters. <laughs> yeah, we had those. Uh, but, yeah, in the desert, though, right, it's totally different than the woods. In the woods, your biggest worry is, like, did I bring toilet paper? Or should I use a leaf or something, right? And you just sort of throw it away into the woods or put it in a trash bag or something. In the desert, right, it's like, okay, if you just pee, just pee in the desert, whatever. The desert's happy to have some fucking water, right? But if you poop in the desert, right, okay, you just leave some poop sitting in the middle of the desert. Who gives a shit it, besides the shit? But how do you wipe yourself in the desert? There ain't no leaf. There ain't no nothing. It's just sand. You can wipe your ass with sand. No. I would waste some of my water. No, it's not going to do it, right? You have to physically wipe. See, what you do is you bring toilet paper with you into the desert. And you bring it out with you? No, and then how do you get rid of the toilet paper? 
right? You set it on fucking fire. That's what you do, right? But you don't set it on fire in the campfire. <laughs> you just you leave. You nah. basically have the designated area. It's like walk at least this many paces away from the fire, the campfire. You know, well, if you even have one in the desert, you might not need one except for cooking. You don't need it for warmth. And then poop, wipe yourself, and then set the toilet paper on fire at the spot you pooped, and then come back. And a lot of people like had trouble setting their toilet paper on fire. It's pretty sad. <laughs> Like, come on, guys. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>